Thankfully, though, we never did give up on that chase because that group started playing games with each other. Despite the fact that Chad and Lachlan were still off the front, they started doing a lot more looking at each other waiting for somebody to make a move than actually riding to make the catch, and this gave Matt Beers and I a chance to catch back on, and sure enough, we made contact with the chase group with about six miles in the race remaining. Welcome back to the channel. This video is fueled by the feed. Unbound really shouldn't need any introduction at this point, but I know that not everyone who may stumble upon this video on YouTube is a massive gravel nerd. So if that's you, first of all, welcome to the dark side, and I'll make this intro quick. Unbound takes place in Emporia, Kansas, and is the biggest and most prestigious gravel race in the world, and it's 200 miles or 320 kilometers long, and it's almost entirely off-road. Rolling hills, wind, heat, bike-destroying mud, flat tires, and other mechanicals are all just the norm here. Just making it to the finish line is an accomplishment in itself, let alone actually racing for the win. Unbound is also part of the Lifetime Grand Prix, which is the premier professional off-road cycling series in the U.S., and to set the stage a bit, coming into this race, I was sitting in, you already know it, I don't even know why I need to say it, 17th place. As fans of the channel know, somehow you can always expect Dylan to finish somewhere between 15th and 20th place, and sure enough, last year I managed a 17th here at Unbound. And I know we joke about that being my spot in these races, but that being said, finishing in the top 20 this year would be a tall order given the competition. Of course there would be all the typical lifetime Grand Prix talent, but this race also attracted the likes of gravel world champion Matej Mohoric, Olympic road race gold medalist and Perry roubaix winner Greg Van Avermont, Perry roubaix winner Nikki Terpstra, and I'm just going to stop right there because if I continue to list all of the talented riders in this race and their achievements, then this video is going to be an hour and a half long. So frankly, in a field filled with this much international talent, if I were to actually finish 17th place, even though that would be a typical result for me, I would be incredibly happy with that. This year the course was going north, which is arguably the harder direction with chunkier gravel and a bit more elevation gain. That being said, there was very minimal wind and mud this year, and the temperature wasn't supposed to be quite as hot as it could be, likely only hitting a high in the mid-80s Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius. And of course, with the most stacked field in the race's history, Things were looking pretty good for the course record of 9 hours and 22 minutes to get beaten, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. This is normally the part of the video where I talk about my bike setup for the race, but I actually already made an entire video about that last week, and thank god I did because this video is long enough as it is. Be sure to watch it if you haven't already though, because I am not running a traditional gravel race setup by any means, with mountain bike tires mounted to 60mm deep aero road wheels, a lauf suspension fork, road gearing, etc. And I'm not gonna lie, given how much of a big deal I made about how this bike was supposedly optimized for this race, it did put a bit of pressure on me to actually perform well in the race, otherwise I'd probably look pretty dumb. <laughs> Now you're worried about looking dumb? Dude, I'm pretty sure that if somebody told you that wearing adult diapers over your bib shorts saved half a watt, you'd have a lifetime supply ordered to your house by tomorrow. With the stage fully set, let's get into how the race played out. The starts of big gravel races like this are always tense, and this one was no exception. I narrowly avoided a crash in the first half mile, and then after that there was a constant jockeying for position as over 150 riders in the pro field fought for just a few spots near the front. Of course, this is similar to road racing, but the difference here is that the surface is constantly changing underneath you, and you can't see what you're hitting, and this is part of the reason why mechanicals and crashes are so common. Making it through the first half of the race unscathed while the peloton of riders is still large is a challenge in itself. The early breakaway formed during this time as well, and despite the fact that you do have to take more wind if you go off the front, it's not a bad strategy to avoid the chaos of riding in such a large pack on sketchy gravel roads. The pace of the opening hour was nothing too crazy at 263 watts NP, but things would start to ramp up quickly as we approached the first major pinch point and technical two-track section 25 miles in. I made my way to the front here and actually got myself positioned very well in about 10th wheel as we hit the double track. 
This was the first real test of the race, requiring 343 watts for over 20 minutes just to stay in contact. We hit smoother gravel and got a bit of respite, but that wouldn't last long as more pinch points and techie bits were just ahead in the next 20 miles. And each time we hit one of these sections, the pace jumped up significantly as the riders on the front tried to splinter the group. The next section 40 miles in required 324 watts NP for 12 and a half minutes and then 303 watts for 30 minutes at mile 50. That being said, perhaps the hardest effort of the race came right after the first feed zone. I had this discussion in my Mid-South video, but the spirit of gravel and therefore the unwritten rule that you wait for everybody to get their stuff in the feed zone before you start going hard again could not be more dead at this point. We're talking about struck by lightning, eaten by sharks, run over by a steamroller, and buried six feet under dead. At Unbound, there are just two feed zones for the entire 200 mile race at mile 70 and 148, and that's it. So you have to carry a lot of fluid and fuel with you in between. But honestly, considering how stressful these stops are, I think I prefer that. Stopping for about 30 seconds to switch out my hydration bladder, bottles, and lube my chain was too much time spent in the pits, if you can believe it. And the team from Felt did an amazing job supporting me as well. It's just that I guess that at this level, a full-on F1 style pit stop is the new normal to stay in contention as there are riders actively trying to use the pits as an opportunity to drop riders from the front group. And while I've never raced World Tour Road, I believe that even they have an unwritten rule that you don't attack in the feed zones. So at least in this sense, gravel has gotten even worse than road at this point. And I'm not complaining about this. In fact, I like to evolve as this relatively new sport evolves too. Complains about the feed zones, then tries to make it look like he's not complaining about the feed zones by giving some half-baked speech about how the sport is evolving. It's good to see that you finally become a true gravel pro, man. So even an incredibly quick pit stop was long enough that I had to chase for eight minutes at 382 watts to catch back on, and the minute I did, we were right back into another technical two-track section of the course. Gaps started forming in the front group and some big efforts needed to be made to close them down. And in total, the 30 minutes following the first feed required 325 watts just to stay in contention. Once things finally settled down, the front group started playing games with each other. Lachlan Morton went off the front and we still had a group of four riders that had been off the front from the beginning to chase down, but no one seemed to wanted to take up the work. Around the halfway point, things got active again as we hit some more technical sections and some of the worst climbing of the course. It was around this point that the race all came back together and now we had a group of probably 30 riders with no breakaway. In this section, Mahorich, who was arguably the favorite going in, had a puncture that would cost him the race. We are gonna stick to road racing, guys. <laughs> Have fun, enjoy out here. It's a beautiful day for cycling, beautiful weather. What'd you think? Not so beautiful surface, could be more smooth. This is what I always say about this race. The start list will always be stacked and very intimidating, but if you can just make it to the finish without getting mechanicals, cramping, bonking, getting dehydrated, etc., then you may be surprised by how well you place in such a stacked field. Of course, that is much easier said than done at Unbound. I had pretty good legs at this point in the race and tried to make some sort of move happen, but nothing ever materialized. And for this 40 minutes of the race, I did an NP of 319 watts. Then Chad Haga and Tij Zoneveld made a move off the front, and they would be quickly joined by Lachlan Morton. And with three riders off the front, the game started again. Riders were starting to not cooperate in the group and refusing to pull through, and this is not uncommon in the second half of a race when legs start to get tired. I also don't blame anyone for choosing this tactic necessarily. You're allowed to race a bike race however you want to race it to get the best result that you can. But this is also how a group of three rides away from a group of 30 to take the win despite there being much more firepower behind. And now he's complaining about people not pulling through. Man, I'll tell you what, if you keep exercising that excuse muscle, you're gonna be at the top of this sport in no time. That group of three off the front turned into a group of two as we caught Zoneveld who was fixing a flat tire. 
Eventually, a select few of us, including Keegan Swenson, Payson McKelvin, Russell Finsterwald, Pete Stetna, Matt Beers, Torbjorn Road, to name a few, and I'm sorry if I missed any of the more notable European names, did start working together to reel in these two riders, despite the fact that we had a lot of riders just sitting on not doing any work. And given that I've never even been on the podium at this race, one could argue that I should have been sitting on and preserving my energy as well. So two riders go off the front and take first and second. You still have the hypothetical chance of getting third place, which is way better than you've ever done at this race before, so why do any work? Sure, but to be honest, I hate seeing the win go up the road without putting up a fight, even if my own chances of getting that win are extremely slim. This upping of pace put us just over 300 watts NP for the next 30 minutes, and then we rolled into the second feed zone at mile 148, and it was another quick pit stop. Again, 30 seconds just seemed too slow. That being said, I did take on much more fluid than my competitors at these stops, which made them a little longer, but I think it was well worth it. While many of my competitors took just two bottles at this stop or maybe bottles in a pack. I took four bottles, a three liter hydration bladder, and a soft flask filled with water down the front of my jersey, which is there to improve aero, provide me with extra fluid, and make me look even more like an aero dork than I already am. This may seem like way too much to carry. After all, there's only 54 miles left in the race remaining. Surely just two big liter bottles would be enough, right? Well, this is what I've learned from doing Unbound five times now. You can't carry enough fluid with you. The only fluid that was actually intended for drinking was the three liter bladder, which fits into my new Rule 28 gravel suit, which, as you can imagine, has been built for exactly this purpose. Optimizing aerodynamics while still being able to carry a lot of water with you like you have to do at races like Unbound. Given that the bladder is filled with ice when I get it too, it actually does a good job of keeping you cool. The four bottles on my bike and the fifth down my jersey are primarily just there to dump on my head, neck, and torso to keep my body temperature down. When you're out in 85 degree heat at hour 8 of Unbound, your power can take a serious hit, and I learned this in 2021. Every time I managed to dump water on myself in that race, which by the end required me actually stopping at creeks, it was an instant 20 to 40 watt boost. Knowing this, this year I actually took heat management into account in my race strategy. The weight weenie cyclists and all of us may gawk at the extra 7 pounds or 3 kilos of water that I had to carry out of the feed zone that I wasn't even intending to drink, but in my experience the disadvantage of carrying the extra weight doesn't even hold a candle to the performance improvement you get from staying cool. Again, for me in the last quarter of Unbound when the temperature is above 80 degrees, this could easily be a 20 to 40 watt boost, and you're only 7 pounds heavier right when you leave the pits. As you approach the end of the race where it really matters, you will have dumped that water and be just as light as everyone else. That was quite a tangent, but I think it was an important one, but let's get back to the race. I did have to chase hard after this second feed zone for 6 minutes at 339 watts. Now into the last quarter of the race, I could tell the group was getting tired, and admittedly, I was too. Pulls were getting weaker and shorter despite the fact that we still had two riders to catch, but I stayed up near the front to assist with the chase, because again, I didn't want to let the very slim potential for the win just slip through our fingers. At mile 180, we hit one of the most significant climbs of the day, and Keegan Swenson punched it up this climb very hard, and in the process dropped me and Matt Beers. Dropped on a climb, huh? Well, it's a good thing that you just made such a big deal about how you're carrying seven pounds of extra water. What's that you said earlier about looking dumb? I was extremely lucky to have been dropped at the same time Matt Beers was because now the two of us could work together to try to reel in that group, and Beers is an absolute powerhouse. He's a multiple time Cape Epic winner, and given his size, he is the perfect rider to work with on the flat sections in the last 20 miles of the course. And then a couple minutes later, we came up on Keegan Swenson, picking himself up off the ground and getting back on his bike. It had looked like he'd been in a crash, and sure enough, he crossed wheels with Russell and went down. I thought this would be perfect for us because Keegan would catch back onto our wheel, and then I'd have arguably the two strongest riders in the race to work with, and certainly we would catch that group back, but he never did end up making contact with us. 
Fortunately, he was okay, no injuries, but that crash was the end of his bid for the win that day. For the next 15 miles, Matt and I traded pretty even poles, and we could see the chase group of nine riders in the distance, but closing that gap seemed almost impossible. And I've got to say, both of us were absolutely smoked at this point in the race, and it really shows in the power file, doing just 253 watts for the next 38 minutes. At a certain point, we almost accepted that we were not going to catch that group and we would just roll in for 12th and 13th place on the day, which is still a hell of a ride, so even in my incredibly fatigued state, I was pretty stoked. Thankfully though, we never did give up on that chase because that group started playing games with each other. Despite the fact that Chad and Lachlan were still off the front, they started doing a lot more looking at each other waiting for somebody to make a move than actually riding to make the catch, and this gave Matt Beers and I a chance to catch back on. And sure enough, we made contact with the chase group with about six miles in the race remaining. Now, when we made a catch, there was a bit of a mishap. I slotted into the group, and when I did that, Petter Havoc moved into my line, and we actually made contact with each other. This caused me to swerve right and cross wheels with Torbjorn Road, and Torbjorn went down. We could argue about whose fault it was or just call it a racing incident, but I did feel bad about it and apologized to him after the race for it. Fortunately, though, he got right back on his bike and caught back on pretty quickly because I would have felt 10 times worse if he had actually gotten dropped there. Now with just five miles remaining in the biggest gravel race in the world, I am sitting in the second group on the road with 11 riders, potentially still in contention for a podium finish. I honestly couldn't believe it. The day already felt like a massive success and I hadn't even hit the finish line yet. But you can't just be happy with where you're at this late into a race because anything from 3rd to 13th place is up for grabs and there's obviously a massive difference between those two results. I know I don't have a great sprint especially considering the firepower in this group. I don't know why I haven't already mentioned this but Greg Van Avermont was still in our group and he's a freaking Olympic gold medalist. Needless to say, my chances of doing anything special in the sprint were pretty slim. So I did try an attack, but it was quickly brought back, and looking back on it, it was pretty weak at 392 watts for 30 seconds. Yeah, uh, hopefully this paints a picture of how cooked I was at this point, and maybe even attempting that attack was a bad idea. Shortly after that, Tobias Konstad, Matea DeMarchi, and Petter Havoc attacked. Russell attempted to respond, and I followed with a pretty pathetic 345 watts for not even a minute, but obviously that was not enough for us to get on their wheel. Man, these numbers at the end of the race here are just depressing. I guess that's not about for you. And at this point, the group of eight riders in this chase group were a spent force. No one really had the legs or motivation to mount any sort of serious chase. In fact, there was a five minute period where we were rolling at a measly 212 watts at the very end of the most important race of all of our seasons with podium positions just going up the road. It was pretty pitiful, or maybe some riders were just saving their legs for the sprint, fair enough, but for me, I just didn't have anything left. The finish of Unbound has a sharp little kicker on pavement about a mile before the line and rolling into it, I knew that everything would blow apart here and I mentally prepared myself for one final max effort, which is just scary to think about given the state that I was in at the time. Sure enough, we hit that climb and we sprinted with everything we had left. Simon Nordal Svensson broke away on the climb and 580 watts for 40 seconds was all I could muster up this final pitch and that put me in the group battling for 7th coming into the finish and I made a quick split second decision to attack the group right after the climb at 437 watts for the last minute of the race and I actually got a gap but then right at the line I was caught by Greg Van Avermont, Payson McKelvin, and Sebastian Schoenberger but I did manage to hold off the Trek boys, Torbjorn and Russell in the bike throw and at the line took 10th place on the day with a time of 9 hours, 16 minutes, and 36 seconds, less than 5 minutes behind the winner, Lachlan Morton. Holy... I could try to describe how I was feeling in that moment for you right now, but I think my interview with Veloworthy right after the race will better do it justice. <laughs> Dylan, what's going through your mind right now? Dude, I am so happy. So happy? Un unbelievable. I can't believe it. That's like way beyond expectation. Congrats, I'm stoked for you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Lockheed won it. I know. Okay. 
dude, I asked him mid-race, I was like, dude, it looks like you have good legs today. He's like, yeah, not really. <laughs> I wasn't lying to him. <laughs> That's the same. They just never get worse. How are your legs feeling? Good. Good. I mean, at the end, I was, I was destroyed, but... That's a bike race, you know? You should be destroyed. <laughs> yeah. Be sure to check out Velo Worthy's full video from the race, link down in the description. I have to say, I am absolutely blown away by what I was able to achieve that day. A top 10 finish in the most stacked and fastest edition of the race ever, being just five minutes down on the winner at the finish, finishing third out of the Lifetime Grand Prix riders, which bumped me up into seventh in the overall, and perhaps most importantly, Finally, I broke the 17th place curse. Like I said, I would have been stoked with a 17th place given the competition this year, so to break into the top 10, I am absolutely over the moon. What? Am I supposed to comment on this? All right, fine. Very nice ride. There, you happy? This is by far the best result of my career so far and the best fitness I've ever had in my life. And given everything I went through in the lead up, which included a hospital visit and a round of antibiotics, it came as a bit of a surprise. I won't go into detail on that right now, but perhaps a how I trained for Unbound video is in order and I will certainly talk about it then. All right, let's look at some overall stats from this massive effort, shall we? We've got an NP of 283 watts for the whole race, average power 241, average heart rate 153, max heart rate, which was hit during my chase after the first feed zone of 182, 21.7 miles per hour or 34.9 kilometers per hour, which is insane to think about for over 200 miles of bumpy gravel, 544 TSS, and just over 8,200 kilojoules. This was also the smallest drop-off in power that I've ever seen from the first half to the second half of this race at 287 watts and 278 watts respectively. And I think a lot of that is owed to my cooling strategy that prevented me from overheating late in the day. If you want some perspective for how much this race has blown up, I did this race for the first time in 2018 and to this day it is still my best finishing result with a ninth place and it is also the worst finishing time that I've ever gotten with 11 hours and 39 minutes, which is almost a full two and a half hours slower than what I got this year. I talk about this so much that it could probably turn into a drinking game at this point, but the rate at which gravel is progressing is absolutely insane. I don't think it'll be long before we see a sub nine hour unbound, and just a couple years ago, a sub 10 hour unbound was a big deal. The last thing I wanna say before I wrap this up is that hopefully this result silences some of the bike setup critics. I know there are some people out there that think I spend way too much time thinking about my equipment and that some of my equipment choices are dumb. For example, using mountain bike tires in a gravel race like Unbound. Personally, a result doesn't prove anything to me because strong riders get great results on suboptimal equipment all the time. And it's usually the same suboptimal equipment that every other rider in the race is also using. So again, it proves absolutely nothing. Yes, I am subtly referring to Perry roubaix here. That doesn't mean that there's not a better way to do it. I know for a lot of people, though, that a result speaks for itself. Well, here you go. The best result of my career so far on a bike that I meticulously tested and optimized for this race. And on the tires specifically, the top three Lifetime Grand Prix riders and the overall race winner, Lachlan Morton, all embraced mountain bike sized tires last weekend. And I actually don't think it's a coincidence that it was us that made it into the top 10 in a sea of international talent. A lot of mishaps can happen in this race, but there is some truth to the you make your own luck mentality when it comes to tires and puncturing. And of course, there's the lower rolling resistance argument as well that I won't get into here, but check out this video if you wanna hear more about that. You often hear people say, it's not the bike, it's the rider. And I would say that for most races, that is mostly true. For Unbound, Vanderpool could show up, and if he had the wrong tires, he ain't winning the race. He's walking out with multiple punctures and getting a ride back into town. You heard it here first, mountain bike size tires are the future of gravel racing, or at the very least, the future of Unbound. For now, I'm just happy to be ahead of the curve, and maybe if I was a little smarter, I would shut up about it so that other pros don't catch on, but it's way too late for that at this point. Look. 
I say this as a friend, man. I think for your own mental sanity, it may not be a bad idea for you to shut up about tires for a bit. Thanks for watching. If you want to follow my racing closer, be sure to check me out on Instagram. I also have coaching and online training plans linked down in the description below. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.